Welcome. Thank you for watching this teaching video from Oak Tree Community Church in South Bend, Indiana. Please check out our other videos and don't forget to like and subscribe. Our mission is to help people come to know Jesus better and love Him more every day. We believe this will not only help our own spiritual growth, but also help us better influence the community and the world for Christ. For more information about Oak Tree, please visit us at oaktreechurch.com. There you will find past message series, online giving options, and more information about our discipleship process that we call The Path. Now, enjoy this message. We'd love to hear from you in the comments or the website contact form. Thank you. Well, good morning, church. Glad to see you this morning. Glad that you're here. Um, I want to add my personal thanks to you for um, uh, last week. Um, as, as Gary already mentioned, our 70th anniversary was a rousing success, at least in my opinion. I thought it went very, very... I think the, the service went well, all of the different components, the, uh, uh, the, the lunch, just and there were so many people involved. Right, it, just because they weren't on the platform doesn't mean so much behind the scenes stuff. And I just uh, many of you helped out with that and and served in that way. And I just want to give my personal thanks to you for the work that you put into last week. And even if you you're like, well, I didn't do anything. You can't, if you were here and you welcomed our guests well, that was a huge part of last week. And so I just want to say thank you. Just personally, I want to say thank you uh, for your part in um, what was a really successful weekend. Um, and I, lots of great comments from, from our guests who were here last week. Um, uh, just, just, they were really, really impressed with, um, um, with, with us, with your welcome, with just the whole thing. And some of them haven't been in, in our church for 50 years. And uh, it's been a long time. And they, they came back and they were celebrating. Well, they, what they thought they were celebrating was, oh, this church is still here. Great. You know, I was a part of this. And what they found was more than just that. What they found is a group of people who still love the same God that they do, who still preach the same message that they did 50, 70 years ago. And what we're doing today, uh, I think I, we, we, we honored them well, I think, and how, how they started and where we are today. And they were really appreciative. The people that I talked to were really appreciative of that. So, um, so that was, that's, that's just, just from me. Thank you very much. We are working our way through the little letter of First John, and uh, we're going to try to... to, to um, did I say... Right? Okay. All right. All of a sudden, I thought I said something wrong. It's... It is First John, right? Okay, good. All right, we're working our way through First John, and uh, uh, should be able to finish up chapter three today. And uh, we've got a few weeks before Christmas, and uh, next week we'll start talking about Christmas. Don't want to do that too early. Not allowed to do that before Thanksgiving, right? You know, everybody else is. The whole world is, you know, jumps straight from Halloween to Christmas. But we're going to go ahead and get Thanksgiving in here, and we'll start talking about Christmas next week. Um. Uh, and we might be able to, if you look at the whiteboard that's in my office, there is this um, uh, very ambitious plan to finish First John yet this calendar year. <clears throat> we'll see how that works. <laughs> yeah. We're in First John chapter 3, and uh, um, I know it's been a week since we, we were in here, um, but we're going to pick up with verse 11 and uh, run down through the, the end of the chapter. So let me read through this. Uh, you can follow along uh, on the screen or in your app or your Bible there. Um, for this, he says in chapter 3, verse 11, for this is the gospel message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not like Cain, who was of the evil one and brutally murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his deeds were evil but his brothers were righteous. Therefore, do not be surprised, brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. We know that we have crossed, uh, crossed over from death to life because we love our fellow Christians. The one who does not love remains in death. Everyone who hates his fellow Christian is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. We have come to know love by this, 
that Jesus laid down his life for us. Thus, we ought to lay down our lives for our fellow Christians. But whoever has the world's possessions and sees his fellow Christian in need and shuts off his compassion against him, how can the love of God reside in such a person? Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. And by this we will know that we are of the truth and will convince our conscience in His presence that if our conscience condemns us, that God is greater than our conscience and knows all things. Dear friends, if our conscience does not condemn us, we have confidence in the presence of God. And whatever we ask, we receive from Him because we keep His commandments and do the things that are pleasing to Him. Now, this is His commandment, that we believe in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as He gave us the commandment. And the person who keeps His commandments resides in God and God in Him. Now by this we know that God resides in us by the Spirit He has given us. All right. So, if you can remember back two whole weeks, Three whole weeks because we covered the same passage over two weeks. <laughs> because we had to break it, we had to break it down because I ran out of time. Uh, from the end of chapter two through the first half of chapter three, John was talking, was shifting the 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 uh, the topic from just knowing God, knowing about God, to okay, what are we supposed to do about this? And he started. He was introducing this topic of of love, and in fact, when we get into chapter four, he's actually going to say God is love. I mean, just straight up, that's, that's one of God's major characteristics that helps inform and influence what He does. It's not everything. It's not the only part about God, and that's a misnomer that we'll, we'll tackle um, because God is more than just love. But he, here John is sort of turning the topic and says, okay, if we really know God, then this is what we should be doing about it. And he's specifically now talking about loving one another. And I really do like how the net translation, uh, which is what I'm using here, um, inserts, or, or sometimes when the, the original text says one another, it says like... Um, uh, verse 14 there, we know that we have crossed over from death to life because we love our fellow Christians, our brothers. Okay, We're talking about within the family of God, within those, those people who know Jesus as Savior. The way we treat each other has an impact on how other people see us and, and of course has an impact within the family of God as well. So, just like John had already presented, as, as he's getting ready to, to really tackle this topic, he's already presented that truly loving God's family, loving God's children, our fellow Christians, is possible only when we are abiding, or in the yellow highlights there, you'll see the word res, remains or residing a lot, where we are really, where we're truly living in, uh, uh, let's say, the sphere in which God is working. Right, uh, you know, there's 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 things that God does, and there's things that God doesn't do. <laughs> and when we're living out here in the things that God doesn't do, uh, our actions are going to look different than when we're living with within the sphere of what God is doing. And that's what he means by remaining or residing or abiding in God, abiding in in His Spirit. Uh, he's used terms like walking in the light. Paul uses terms, phrases like walking in the Spirit to, to describe that type of thing. And when John talks about righteousness, especially in this context, he's talking about that specific area of how we are um, loving each other. Just by way of reminder, believers are the audience. Okay, the, John is writing to people who already know Jesus as Savior. And this concept of abiding those abiding in Christ, walking in the light, walking in the Spirit, walking in life. He's going to bring up life versus death in this passage. That is where we really shine, if I can put it that way. That's where we'll really actually begin to pick up on what he is, uh, what he's, what he says you can experience this life, but only if you abide in Christ. Now, um, here in verses 11 and 12, um, did you notice that he presented 
Cain as like the antithesis of brotherly love? <laughs> and any, any guesses why? Does everybody remember the story of Cain and Abel? Do you know the story of Cain and Abel? Back in Genesis chapter 4, one of the very first things that we learn about, if, you, if, you, if you've heard this, Genesis chapter 4, Adam and Eve, the first people, have been kicked out of God's presence, kicked out of this special place where they met with God, this orchard, this garden where they met with God, and they've been banished from that, and they're raising up these, the, their, their children, and uh, we don't know exactly how old Cain and Abel were. Um, I happen to think that they were probably in their 120s. I take the, the ages in the, the early parts of the Bible, I take them very literally. So people were living hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years because God created us to not die. You know, death is, is an anomaly, physical death. We're not supposed to die. And so I think they were in their 120s. We're not talking bratty teenagers at this point. We're talking people who should know better. And uh, John summarizes the, the story from Genesis that Abel had righteous works, righteous deeds. Cain had unrighteous deeds. And that's why he killed his brother. Not something that you really do under the guise of brotherly love, right? <laughs> it says, don't be like Cain. But what's interesting What's interesting is that John is going to use a couple of different words for kill in this passage. And uh, they don't necessarily come across uh, very well in some of our translations. I love the fact in, in verse 12 here that uh, th this translation I'm using says brutally murdered. That's what's going on here. Okay, um, Cain didn't just you know punch him and knock him out, didn't just hit him over the head. With, with a rock, there's, a, there's a, a thing going on right now that says that, you know, there's you know, gun controls and, and all of those things that the politicians like to talk about. And there's this, this thing that keeps coming up, and it really bothers me every time it comes up. And it says, um, guns are not the problem. Cain killed his brother with a rock. Ban rocks. I'm like, Okay, first of all, we've got apples and oranges there. Secondly, I don't think it was a rock. Okay, it doesn't tell us exactly what happened, but here's my, here's my speculation. So do with it what you want, right? This word that we have translated brutally murdered here um, shows up only a handful of times in the New Testament. Okay, only about eight or nine times. And every time it refers to a slaughter. Not just a oh, I killed you. Not even just, I murdered somebody, but a slaughter. It shows up here in 1 John 3, and it shows up in the Revelation. That's it. And if you know anything about the book of the Revelation, you know that there's a lot of death going on in there. And it refers to Jesus, who was slaughtered. It refers to uh, martyrs who are slaughtered for their, their faith. It refers to a coming world war where people will be slaughtered en masse. That's the word that John chose to describe what Cain did. So here's my speculation. I think what happened was this. We know from Genesis chapter 4 that Abel killed an animal to give to God, and Cain brought some produce from his farm. I don't think that was the problem. Some people think that it was supposed to be a blood sacrifice. Maybe it was. I don't particularly think so. Um, I could be wrong. I think they brought the best of what they had. I think it was a heart problem. I think Cain's attitude was wrong. But he took it in such a way that maybe, maybe there was a blood component that was supposed to be part of it because here's how I imagine the conversation between Cain and God. You want a blood sacrifice? I'll give you a blood sacrifice. Abel, come here. And he took him out into the field, and according to John's word here, slaughtered him. Not just knocked him over the head with a rock and left him for dead, but slaughtered him to the point where when God came back to Cain, said Abel's blood, which is all over the ground, not just you killed him and he bled out, but it's just... It was a brute, is crying out from the ground because of what you did. Now, I don't think anyone here 
is in danger of going to slaughter somebody. You may feel like it some days, and you don't. You withhold, and that's good, right? <laughs> so I don't think that's our danger. And so why would John say, don't be like Cain? Well, I don't intend to be like Cain. <laughs> I don't intend to go slaughter anybody. I don't certainly don't intend to go slaughter another Christian or, or whatever. Uh, what's, what's the thing behind it? I think it's the heart. I think it's the heart is taking out our, um, our, our aggression, taking out our defensiveness against someone else or even God on these people who are closest to us. Even if we don't slaughter them, the reason that this even came up is because his heart was evil, his actions were evil, and his actions are show what's in his heart. Cain's and Abel's actions showed what was in their hearts. We're supposed to be actively loving each other, and when we don't actively love each other, it shows that there's something wrong inside, not just outside. And so he used Cain as sort of a, a, a shock illustration. Oh, I would never do that. Okay, you might not, but do you understand how close it is? Okay, and he's going to come back to this concept of killing again. So apparently, that <laughs> he knows what's inside of us, right? He comes comes back to this again. Um, he says in verse thirteen, "Don't be surprised, brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. Why? Because what? Because of our heart? Why else? Why would the world?" Hate if believers are the audience. Why would the world hate believers? What do you think? Because of what? Because the world hates Christ. Because of what's in us. You said it's because of our heart, and that's it's absolutely true. Because if we know Christ is Savior, we have the Holy Spirit in us. We have God Himself living in us. He's trying to change us from the inside out. And so, because of what's in our hearts, because the world already hates Christ. Why would it surprise us if it hates us too? Satan himself is diametrically opposed to God and God's people. Always has been. Always has. From the very beginning, he was lying and slandering God. From the very beginning. And he tried to trick, which he did, humans who were worshiping God, who were in, in connection with God at the time. He's always been about that. He's been so opposed to whatever God is doing. So if God is doing a work in you, why wouldn't He be opposed to that? And we know that He right now runs the world. Now, it's true, it's under God's permission. I get that. Okay, God, God has given Him permission to run the world. But right now, Satan runs the world. And so if Satan is running the world and he hates believers, he hates what God is doing, why wouldn't his world system hate what God is doing and hate us as well? Right? If he's against us, his world system, and if his world system is going to hate us, it shouldn't surprise us. We shouldn't be caught off guard. With, like, what? But I'm such a nice person. Why would anybody hate me? I get that. You're nice people. and Nobody should hate you. But... It's not because we're nice people. It's not because we keep the laws. It's not because we, uh, you know, give and we help out in our works and we, you know, all the all the different things, you know, PTAs and all that stuff. It's not because we're involved. It's not because of any of that. It's because if we are living the way God wants us to live, if our worldview, if our mindset is what God is trying to create in us, then it will be opposed to Satan's world. That's what the problem is. Because you cannot, I cannot go through this world. Satan's world, First, we'll see at the end of chapter 5, you can look at it, verse 20, that the whole world lies in the power of the wicked one. We cannot go through Satan's world right now with God's worldview and expect that everything's going to be fine. Of course it's going to go against us. Of course Satan's world is going to hate us. And John says, just in case you hadn't encountered this yet, once we start living the way God wants us to live, once we start thinking the way God wants us to think, don't be shocked if all of a sudden you start getting pushback. 
Don't be shocked if all of a sudden you start facing some things in your life that you're like, why is this happening? John says, I'll tell you why. Because you're starting to grow in Christ. You're starting to mature past where you were, past where Satan's world is comfortable with you being, and it's going to push back against you. What are you going to do about it? You're going to fold? You're going to collapse? You say, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know that wasn't allowed. Or are we going to press on, keep on pushing down the path and find out just how much we are countercultural when we're doing things God's way? Satan's world's going to hate us. We have to be ready for it. We have to know about it. We have to be ready for it. Now, verse 14. We know that we have crossed over from death to life. This is a great word, by the way. This is a great word to pass over or to cross over. We find it in the, in the Gospel of John as well. Jesus is the one who used it. And, and I've, I've mentioned in the past several connections, lots of overlap between the Gospel of John and 1 John. I think he just took the Gospel, condensed it, and put it in a letter. There's a lot of similar themes, a lot of similar topics, a lot of vocabulary that's the same between these two books, the Gospel and, and 1 John. And, he, and he's packed Packaging it up in such a way that is sort of like, almost like part two. The Gospel of John is part one. This is who Jesus is. I want you to believe in Jesus as the Son of God. I want you to have eternal life. I want you to know all this stuff. And now here is how you live that out. It's really a part one, part two. And so it, it makes sense that there would be a lot of similar themes here. And Jesus says that we have crossed over from, to, from death to life. And John says, okay, it's, it's, it's true that we have, but how do we know? And this is important because um, we, we know that we have passed over is not the same as we have passed over because of our actions. Salvation is never about what we do, right? Salvation is never about our actions. So what John is really picking up on is how do we know that we are truly in the family of God? How do we know that we're believers? How do we know? He says one of the ways that we can know is by looking at our lives, looking at our actions. Okay, It's not the only way. There are a lot of good people out there who do a lot of good things and they want nothing to do with Jesus. Nothing to do with God, nothing to do with anything related to Christianity. They just seem to be good people. So, and I'm sure you know a lot of them, actually. Probably some in your family and work, and, and, and maybe you were that way before you came to know Jesus as, as your Savior. You're like, well, I'm a good person. And you probably were. That's great. It just doesn't count for anything. That's the problem. Good people still die. Good people still have to face the Creator. So the question isn't, am I good enough? The question is, have I passed over out of death into life and am I living that way now or am I still living as if I were spiritually dead? Our actions should tell others that we're saved, but our actions can't save us. John said this is how we can know, but it's not how we become. Right? It's, not how, it's not what saves us. And it's an, interesting, it's an interesting thought here, and I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago, but I wanted to bring it back up. Because verse 14, again, says, um, we know that we have crossed over from death to life because we love our fellow Christians. That's one of the ways that we can know. The one who does not love in this context remains in death doesn't mean that they're unsaved, but they are, they're abiding in this old system. They're abiding in this old world. They're living in this old nature that they should have been able to come out of and that for whatever reason, they're still choosing to live there. And what's interesting is that Christians who are living in sin don't prove that they're not saved. It just is the fact that they don't know God yet. They really don't know God yet. I mean, think of it this way. If we, if you really, really know someone, let's say you've got a friend, maybe your spouse, a good friend, something, you, you, you really know this person, a sibling maybe, and you're just so close to this person. 
you know what they like, you know what they don't like, you know what they love, you know what they hate, you know, you know all the quirks, all the idiosyncrasies, all of everything. And if you're sarcastic like I am, then you know which button, buttons to push and you love pushing those buttons, right? That's just part of the thing, right? But let's step aside for that for just a second. If you really know this person, in addition to pushing all the buttons, you know what makes them tick and you, you sometimes, you'll go out of your way to do things that they like, right? Just to show that you love them. You go out of your way to, it's like, you know what? She really likes this. He really likes this. I'm, yeah, I'm just, just because. Or you're going through life and you're like, man, they really don't like that. Yeah, let's, let's, you know, sidestep that for a while. We're just not going to do that. Maybe you're planning a party. You're planning a get together for, you know, for this person, you know, birthday party or something. And, and somebody's like, oh, I know we should do this. You're like, man, they don't like that at all. They don't like that at all. Let's not. And they don't even have to know about it. And, 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 and you protect each other, and it's just this really great relationship where your actions actually show that you really know this person, what they like, what they don't like. How would that look if, or how would this world look even, if Christians, those of us who, who claim to know God, those of us who know Jesus as Savior at least, if we really, 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 really truly knew God? And when we talk about the path here, we talk about knowing him better and loving him more. What if as, as we're going down the path, we're getting to the place where we really do know God. We know what makes him tick. We know what he really likes. We know what he really hates. We know those things. And what if we lived that way? You think that this world, I'm not saying that we'll ever fix this world because I know we won't. Only Jesus can do that. But don't you think that this world would look a little bit different if the people who call themselves Jesus followers actually lived out what God likes and dislikes based on what we know from Scripture? What would our homes look like? What would our workplaces look like? What would just our, our little congregation here, our church, what would it look like if we who claim to know Jesus actually did know Him really well and lived that out. Ideally, we would say, it wouldn't look any different at all, because that's where we're at. In reality, <laughs> it would probably look a little different, wouldn't it? My home would look different, your home would look different, our workplaces, everything would look a little bit different if we were living out. See, we're not, we're not proving that we're not saved. When we, when we live in sin, when we walk in the darkness, when we're, when we're walking according to this old dead nature, when we're living that way, we're not saying we're not saved. What we're really saying is, I just really don't know God yet. Because if I really knew God, I wouldn't do this and I would do this and simply because I love Him. Not because it's a checklist. You know, we talk about checklists a lot. Not because it's a checklist. Not because I have to. Not because He's going to be mad at me if I don't. But simply because we love Him and we know Him. That's what John's saying here. When we, when, we, when we live in sin, it's really we're, we've, we've passed over from death to life, but it's like we're still living the old way. Everyone who does not love his fellow Christians, specifically in this context, when it comes to loving our fellow Christians. Now, here he comes again with this whole death concept. He says in verse 15, everyone who hates his fellow Christian is a murderer. Now, I want to remind you that uh, in the Jewish mindset, and this is ancient, this is modern, this is just part of the whole thing. In the Jewish mindset, love and hate are not necessarily emotions. Love and hate have to do with volition or choice in a lot of, in a lot of terms, especially when they're set up as opposed to each other. Okay? It's not just like, you know, I love chocolate and I hate almonds unless they're together in a Hershey bar, right? You know, that's the, you know, I, I, you know if, you, if you offer me with something with almonds in it, I'm going to, okay, yeah, I'll eat it, but it's not going to be the thing that I like. You know, if you offer me something with chocolate in it, there's a good chance I'll really like it. You know, that type of thing. That's not what we're, we're talking about in love and hate most of the time when they're set apart like this. Love and hate 
in, in a Jewish context especially, has to do with choosing one over the other. And it doesn't have to be emotional in any way. It could simply be the choice that what you chose to wear this morning means that you chose to not wear something else. You rejected something else. Why? Doesn't matter. Doesn't really matter. You decide, I'm just going to go a different route to work today. Okay, you love that way, you hate the other way. I really don't hate the other way. I go that way a lot. It's not, that's not what we're talking about. It's about choosing one thing over something else. God does this throughout the Old Testament. We see this especially with the nation of Israel where He chose Israel. He loves Israel. He rejected all of the other nations to be where the Messiah came through, to, to be His place of blessing. It doesn't mean He hates everybody else in the whole world. <laughs> he just chose them. He loves them. He hates them. Not an emotional thing, just a choose and a reject. That's all it is. So in this context, we're talking about loving our fellow Christians or hating our fellow Christians. I think a lot of it has to do with how we choose to act. Right? Am I choosing in their interest or am I choosing against their interest? Am I choosing something that may hurt them? Or am I choosing something that is going to help them? And he uses... Um, He's already used he's already used um, uh, uh, Cain as an illustration, and now he's going to use um, or he's going to use a word that uh, we're going to connect to Satan here in just a second. Verse fifteen: Everyone who hates his fellow Christian is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. There's our word, abiding, residing. We've seen Jesus has already said in Matthew chapter 5 in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, if you hate somebody, it is likened to murder, right? It's like, hold on a second. You know, I, I don't care. I'm, I, I may dislike them. I may say that I hate them, but I'm not going to go around killing people. What's interesting is just like the word for brutally murder and slaughter is really rare in the New Testament, so is this word that John chose and I think he chose these words for a reason. There are other words he could have chosen. And he chose these words for a very specific reason. This word translated murderer, the only other place it shows up is, what do you know, the Gospel of John. <laughs> Chapter 8, verse 44, and it's Jesus who used it. And Jesus is talking about Satan, and he said that Satan was a murderer from the beginning. Now hold on a second. Who did Satan kill? Do you remember your Bibles? Remember, uh, did, did Satan kill any of the angels in heaven? No? Okay. Uh, so then he came down to earth. He's tempting Adam and Eve. Did he kill Adam and Eve? Okay, so God said you will surely die. You will certainly die. And they were separated from God. And then physical death came later as a part of the curse. But who caused that? Did Satan cause that? They chose to do it. It was at, In fact, Adam is the one whom God holds responsible for that. Adam had the opportunity to say, um, no. In fact even though Eve was tricked into it, in 1 Timothy 2, Paul specifically says Adam was not. He knew full well what he was doing. He went into it, his eyes wide open. He chose to do that. Satan didn't make him do it. He didn't even make her do it. He didn't make anybody. He tempted them. He tried to seduce them, but he didn't make anybody do it. So I'm not sure that you could say that Satan killed them. So if he's a murderer from the beginning, who did he murder? I think that's really it. I think that mur especially when Jesus connects hate and murder, and now John is connecting hate and murder, especially in the context of choosing one thing and rejecting another, what did Satan do? Satan, when he rejected God's plan, 
when he rejected what God had said, and then he went around, Ezekiel 28 says that he went around to the other angels in heaven like a merchant selling his product, he was slandering God's name. Did you hear what God said? Do you hear what he said? Can you believe what he said, what he's doing? He is wrong. He is slandering God's name to some of the to these other angels. Ezekiel 28 says, some of them followed him. He came down to the planet here. And what did he do? The same thing to people. Oh, you're not going to die. In fact, God knows that if you eat this, you're going to be like him. See, God is withholding something good from you. God does not want what's best for you. So was he loving them or was he hating them? Was he choosing in their best interest or was he choosing against their best interest? Was he rejecting their best interest? See, he pointed angels away from God. He pointed people away from God because he was already going away from God. And even though he didn't kill anybody in the context that we usually think of kill or murder, he was hating by his actions, by his heart, by his words, he showed that he hated not only God, but he hated everything and everyone around him to the point that he was willing to slander God's name to try to get everybody to leave God. He's on his way out and he wants to drag as many people and angels and everything along with him. That's hate, isn't it? On a spiritual level, I mean, that's, that seems like that's hate. That seems like that is a death sentence. Murder. That's what he did. And Jesus said Satan has been a murderer like that from the very beginning. That's what he does. And now John here in 3.15 says, anyone who hates his fellow Christian is doing the exact same thing that Satan has done from the very beginning. The exact same thing. He's murdering. He's, he's, he's offering a death sentence. He's rejecting them, possibly even pointing them away from God, just like Satan did. You've got to be careful with that. Now, you know what's interesting? You know, a lot of people memorize John 3.16, right? John 3.16, you know, for God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. It's a good verse to memorize if you haven't, right? Most people don't memorize 1 John 3.16. It's also a very good verse. It's just one that we don't like so much. We like Jesus loving us, God loving us. Look at verse 16, 1 John 3, 16. We have come to know love by this. Yes, all right, what about love? Jesus laid down his life for us. That's awesome, just like John 3, 16. We're so happy about that. Can we just end the verse there? <laughs> Can we put a period? No. Thus, therefore, because of this, in this same way, if... Literally, if he did that, we ought to lay down our lives for our fellow Christians. You know, you can only do that once, right? Once you die for somebody, you can't do it again. So is that what he's talking about? Does it have to be physical death? No. I don't think so. And I think you're right. Just like Satan, as the murderer from the beginning pointed people away from God and life and hated people. I think in the same way, John now is saying, listen, we should put ourselves in a position where we are leading people to God and life. We are laying down our rights. When Jesus came from heaven to earth, he laid aside his rights as God, Philippians chapter 2, so that he could lead us to God. He didn't come in here storming and, and saying, I'm God, I have all my rights, bow down and worship me and all this stuff. He, he lived just like us so that he could show people how to get to God, even if that meant he did not claim his rights. And I think John here says the same thing. There are times when we just, it's okay to choose somebody else over ourselves especially if that helps point them to God, point them to life. Jesus showed that he loved people by laying down his life. And one way that we can follow his example is by helping those who have physical needs. This is what we see in verses uh, um, uh, 17 and then, and then 18. But whoever has the world's possessions and sees his fellow Christian in need, 
shuts off his compassion against him, how can the love of God reside in such a person? Now, this is. let me tell you what this doesn't say. This doesn't say that every time a commercial comes on the TV or the radio or whatever, and there's, there's organizations out there that everybody in the world has needs, right? This doesn't say that just because somebody is a couple of dollars short this month, you always have to give. Okay, that's not what this says. And I'll tell you why. Because the couple of words, again, that he chose, he specifically chose these words to, to write this letter. He said, first of all, whoever sees his fellow Christian is in need. This is not one of the normal words for, for just looking or glancing. It's not a passing glance. This is a watching. This is investigating. Okay, this is not somebody says, oh, I have a need, so you're just shelling out money, you're shelling out stuff all the time with no care, with no responsibility. This is, you're watching, you're carefully looking at the situation, maybe you've investigated the situation. It's more than a passing glance. This is knowledge of what's going on. And if you've done that, you've looked into it, yeah, this person really does have a need. This isn't just, you know, this isn't, you know, because they were irresponsible or they're, you know, whatever, whatever. But this person, man, this person really has a need. And I can help. Let's not forget that aspect that this, not being irresponsible with our stuff, not putting ourselves, our families into a desperate situation. Okay. If we have the capability, if we have the world's possessions, and we see a fellow Christian who really does have a need, and we know it, and maybe we've investigated, we've looked into it, that should do something in our hearts. That should, in our hearts, say, hey, they need, it's a legitimate need, I can help. What's the logical conclusion? Help, right? That's the logical conclusion. John says, you know what hating somebody looks like? You have the capability. They have the need. You have the capability. And in your heart, and maybe in their face, you slam the door. This is this word used shuts off. Me is used to slam a gate, slam a door. To just, just, just to look at the whole situation and have such a heart that should be, I can help take care of this person. I can help my fellow Christian. You look at that and say, and walk away and not care at all. John says that's what hating, that's one example, that's what hating looks like. Loving says we should help this person. Hating says, I'm just going to slam the door in their face and walk away, and i got better things to do with my time and life and money and everything else. Jesus laid down His entire life. He actually died for us. We can spend some time or some money or some goods or some whatever when we know that there's a legitimate real need, can't we? He says that for the person who slams the door, he has this question. How in the world <laughs> can the person who slams the door in somebody's face, when they have the ability, when they see the need, how can that person really say that they have the love of God in them? How can that person really say that they're walking in truth, walking in the light, walking in the Spirit, walking in Christ? when they're doing exactly the opposite. That person is, in this context, using John's vocabulary, that person is a murderer. The same way that Satan has been a murderer from the very beginning. He hates people. He chooses himself over everybody else. He doesn't care about anybody else. And what he does actually hurts the person. That's a murderer. That's what John says. How can such, or how can the love of God reside in such a person? So his conclusion is, so let us love, uh, not love just with word or tongue, but in deed and truth. 
and by this we will know. This is a phrase that comes up over and over and over, and that's why we've got it highlighted. By this we will know that we are of the truth, verse 19, and will convince our conscience in His presence. He's already brought this up once uh, in, in, uh, at the end of chapter 2. He says, Jesus is coming back. We're going to stand before Him. We're going to give an account, right? We're going to give an account for what we did, what we didn't do, some kind of exit interview. I'm not sure exactly how it's all going to work. And we're going to be rewarded for what we did well with the right motives for Jesus. Great. And back in, in chapter 2, verse 28, he talks about we can either stand in confidence and speak with boldness, or we can slink away in shame. Those are going to be the two options. He comes back to this concept of boldness and speaking with boldness here. We'll convince our conscience in His presence. Verse 20, if our conscience condemns us, we know that God is greater than our conscience and He knows all things. Have you ever been through a period in your life where you are not sure that you're doing what's right? Has anybody else beside me been through? You're just not sure. You're conscious. You're, you're, you just, I don't, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. I don't know if this is right. Maybe you've been through a period where you weren't even sure you were saved. You're like, I, I, I don't, can this, maybe, maybe I haven't been saved this whole time. Maybe I, I, I'm just so, and, and your heart is in such confusion and your conscience is in such confusion. Have you ever been there before? Okay. John says, listen. Listen. I understand those doubts. I understand that can happen. Here is the promise. God is bigger than all that. Isn't that great? God is bigger than all that. Even if your heart, even if your conscience is throwing all sorts of things at you, you've got a ton of doubts, you've got a, your conscience is just like, Ugh. and you're like, I don't know what to do. He says, it's God. No, sometimes we have doubts about whether we're on the path, on the right track. Maybe we uh, doubts about even we're saved. John tells us to look at our hearts and our actions especially our actions toward fellow believers. That should give us an idea, but if it doesn't, if it doesn't, God still knows all things. And I have to tell you, one of my favorite verses in the book of Hebrews is chapter 6, verse 10, and I want to show you this very quickly, and we'll come back and finish 1 John 3 here. But Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10, I memorized this a long time ago because... Um, uh, just my personality and my role and just the different things that I've, I've done over the years. A lot of insecurities, lots of doubts, especially years ago. And I found this verse and I loved it and I went ahead and I grabbed hold of it and I've never forgotten it. He, in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10, God is not unjust so as to forget your work and the love that you have demonstrated for His name in having served and continuing to serve the saints. Even if your heart is constantly slamming you, even if you're completely full of insecurities and doubts, the, Hebrew, the writer of Hebrews and 1 John both say, God knows. And in fact, Hebrews says, if God would forget, He would actually be in the wrong to do so. He'll never forget. One day, even if you can't stand and speak with boldness, it could be that God brings out this whole other list and says, hey, did you forget about these things? Well, I wasn't really sure about that. And I'm, I, Hold on a second, it's my turn to talk. Because I didn't forget. Isn't that great? I love that verse. I love that verse. God will not forget, no matter what we're going through. Back in verses 19 and 20, Verse, verse 20, if our conscience condemns us, He's greater than our conscience and knows all things. And in verse 21, if our conscience does not condemn us, maybe you're like, I have no doubts. I have no insecurities. I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. That's great. I feel good for you. Because many of us are not like that, right? Okay? Many of us are not like that. And he says, if you don't, if your conscience is not condemning you, we have confidence. That's our word right there. That, that word translated confidence is the same as boldness before. You have boldness when you're in the presence of God. You can speak with, with confidence. You can speak boldly. I served you to the best of my ability. I loved my fellow Christians. 
And that is great. Verse 22, and whatever we ask, we receive from him because we're keeping his commandments and we do the things that are pleasing to him. Great. I got a whole list of things I want to ask him for. Is that what he's talking about? I don't think so. John will actually clarify this a little bit in chapter 4 about asking things according to God's will. But in this right here, he says, listen, if you are walking exactly the way you're supposed to, if you're living the way you're supposed to, in the light, in the truth, in the all of the other words he's used, with Jesus, when you say, hey, God, I would love to be able to do this. I'd be, I'd love to be able to have this. I'd love to be able to whatever. God can answer that prayer because you're asking in line with what he's already doing because you're walking with him. Right? Parents, you know, when some when when one of your kids is is living well, they're making good choices, what wouldn't you give them? Right? What wouldn't you do for them? But when they're off doing all these other things and you're like, shouldn't do that, shouldn't do that, shouldn't do that. Hey, can I have? Yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> Cuz I know you're going to go be crazy. I know what you're going to do with it. God's the same way. He's like, when you, are, when you are living the way I expect you to live, when you're living out of love for me, out of love for each other, you're choosing the best. And What wouldn't he do for us? Because we're asking according to his will. We're asking all, just as a parent. I really, I really get that. Um, I'm sure there's a slide that has something on that. Boldness in the same one. We're living with a clean conscience. We're able to speak with boldness when we give our report. I already said that. Verse 23 is where we're at now. Now this is His commandment. That we believe in the name of of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as He gave us His commandment. Now this is interesting because this is a nuanced version of what a lot of people call the great commandment. In the Old Testament and in the Gospels, the great commandment is love God, love people. Right? Love God, love your neighbor. Well, even in Israel, your neighbor was your fellow Israelites. Okay, not the entire planet. Love God, love your neighbor. But now John says, I'm going to nuance this just a little bit in the in for the church age for what we're living in now. It's not just love God, but specifically make sure you believe in Jesus. Believe in Jesus specifically. And love your fellow Christians. Okay, that, that's carried over. Love God, love your neighbor is nuanced just a little bit now for our great commandment. Believe in Jesus, love your fellow Christians. That is the commandment that He has given to us. And He just got done saying, if we're living out His commandments, if we're keeping His commandments, and we're doing the things that are pleasing to Him, what is that? We believe in Jesus and we're loving our fellow Christians. Then He responds in, 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 a, in a way that, that seems beneficial to us. Why? Because He's a good Father. And finally, verse 24, and the person who keeps his commandments, especially these two commandments, these great commandments that uh, he just listed, the person who keeps these commandments resides, abides, remains in God and God in him. This is not a salvation issue. This is a growth issue, a sanctification issue. We're actually living out what we're supposed to live out because God is living through us. We're residing in Him and we have this great mutual relationship. We're not living in darkness. We're not living in death. We're not living in all this other stuff that He warns us about. He says it's it's, it's this spiritual sweet spot, if I can put it that way, where we are living in Him the way He's designed us and He's living in and through us. When we are keeping His commandments, that's where we find ourselves. And here's how we know. Again, it's not here's what makes it happen, but here's how we know. By this we know that God resides in us by the Spirit He has given to us. Romans chapter 8, verse 16 says that the Holy Spirit bears witness or testifies along with our spirit that we are the children of God. The Holy Spirit living inside of us, He reminds us, and He can help us, it convinces us that we are the children of God. But if we're not walking in the Spirit, if we're not staying in line with the Spirit, how are we listening to Him? How, how, can, how can we hear Him? And this is really where discipline comes in. Because just like a good parent loves to bless and honor their children when they're doing well, what happens when their children are not doing well? 
have to discipline our children, right? And Hebrews chapter 12 says that God is a good parent, <laughs> which means that God disciplines those whom he loves. Because a parent who doesn't love their children doesn't discipline their children. And a parent who doesn't discipline their children shows that they don't really love them the way they could. Because part of a parent's job is to shape and grow and point our children in the right direction. And sometimes discipline is necessary for that. And God says, those whom I love, I discipline. Because I want you to walk in a very particular way. And if we are children of God, and if we are residing in Him, and we decide that we're going to not stay on the path, we're going to take a little detour over here, sometimes He comes along with a little spiritual paddle to get us back on the path. Not because He hates us, not because He likes hurting us, but because He wants us to grow in the best way possible. And John says, how do we know that we're doing that? He's given us His Holy Spirit. We can look at our actions. We can see how we're treating each other. And that can give us some guidelines and some boundaries to know if we're staying on the path. And if not, we should confess and get back on. And if we don't, God may just come over and swat us back into place. And hopefully, hopefully it just takes a little swat and not a big, big uh, well, whatever is a big, big thing for you <laughs> to get you back on the path. Two questions real quickly as we close. Do my actions toward other believers prove to myself and prove to others that I'm becoming like Jesus? Is it obvious? It's not always obvious. Sometimes growth is very slow and quiet, and it starts in our hearts, but eventually it should show, right? Eventually it should show. And can you say right now, I am living with a clear conscience before God. If Jesus were to come back right now, today, this second, and I stand before Him and I have to give my report, could I do so with a clear conscience? Could I speak with boldness? Or would I sort of be, no, you go first. <laughs> you go first. Try to get back to the back of the line because we're ashamed of where we are today. The great part is, is that even if you're ashamed of where you are today, we don't have to stay there.